Welcome and thank you for coming today. Um, the title of my talk is On a Mission to Improve Maternal Infant Care in the Dominican Republic. Uh, a big endeavor, but certainly one that I aspire to in the next uh, few years of my life. Um, I uh, have an objective today to help you understand what the current crisis is in maternal child health care in the Dominican Republic. I would like to expose some of the participants here to what is involved in a medical mission and the work involved in an underserved part of the world and hopefully inspire some of the young minds to consider such work in the future. The mission statement of the organization Physicians for Peace that we had on our way there involved the following. The mission was to assess the current maternal child health care situation in Santo Domingo um, in a county hospital setting to evaluate what Physicians for Peace could do to improve the situation with collaboration, education, provision of supplies, etc to provide education, hands-on lectures, workshops, to work with the Resource Mothers Program, which I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to develop diabetes screening program. And I deployed for the first five days alone and then was joined by Stephen Warsaw here in the front, as well as his wife, Lisa Warsaw, for the last two days of my mission. To introduce some of you who may not know very much about the Dominican Republic, it occupies the eastern two-thirds of the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. One land border that it has is with Haiti. The population is about 10 million. The capital, Santo Domingo, is densely populated with 2.3 million uh, individuals, and the ethnic groups are mixed for the most part, but there's also a fair number of uh, people of European descent and of African origin living on this island. Interestingly, the Dominican Republic contributes to the largest number of major league baseball players in the world, which is really quite an amazing statistic. Now, switching gears to more important factors in my mind, um, let's look at infant mortality, um, the statistics reported in 2012 by the World Bank. Of course, if we look at uh, places like Somalia, the infant mortality is approximately 91 per thousand live births followed by a close second of Haiti in my graph of 57 per thousand live births. But the Dominican Republic is very close at 23 infants that die per thousand live births compared to six um, in the United States. That is, the Dominican Republic has a fourfold greater infant mortality rate. The infant mortality is defined as the death of a child um, at less than one year of age. Now, what about maternal mortality? For the same year, Somalia, of course, uh, has a very high maternal mortality of 1,000 per 100,000 live births, Haiti 350 per 100,000 live births. The Dominican Republic has reported to have 150 per 100,000 live births compared to 18 in the United States. That reflects about a seven-fold uh, times higher mortality in the Dominican Republic compared to the United States. Now, the discrepancy in these statistics and what I found fascinating is that usually you associate or you equate the lack of access to a skilled healthcare professional for delivery with a higher maternal and infant mortality. But if you look at this graphic, what it shows is that, yes, in Somalia and in Haiti, the access to a healthcare professional is quite abysmal. But in the Dominican Republic, 95%, 95% of patients that deliver a baby actually are delivered by a skilled healthcare professional. So why is this, is, is this discrepancy in maternal mortality and infant mortality so dramatic? Well. Unfortunately, just recently in August, it's been all over the news, maternal mortality remains very high in the Dominican Republic, despite efforts to, to diminish this. The recent article in the Dominican Today uh, paper quoted, the lack of fulfillment of the rules and the guidelines and the care procedures, the biosecurity, the delay in emergency obstetrical care, and shortages of medicines and equipment and the lack of specialized personnel on duty in the hospitals are the main factors associated with this situation. 
according to this study. Well, I got excited by this because I can't go and tell people you need to go to the hospital to deliver your baby, but I can help change the hospitals and I can help educate the physicians and the nurses that are providing care that may be not as optimal as it should be to try to diminish the risk of maternal mortality and infant mortality. Now, it's estimated that approximately 80% or more of maternal deaths are, pre are preventable in this situation. What are the main causes of maternal death? Well, of course, postpartum hemorrhage, hypertension complications, sepsis, and importantly, unsafe abortion. Many women die not because they can't get to the doctor, but because they have limited prenatal care and they can't get to the hospital fast enough. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to uh, a video um, that uh, really describes in my mind a little bit of the pictorial events that happen in the Hospital Las Minas in Santo Domingo. And this actually is an intro to the place where I worked for a week. I, I basically was in green scrubs, I had a fanny pack on, I had my iPhone with its charger in my pack, and I carried around my own toilet paper since none of the bathrooms had toilet paper. You had to bring your own toilet paper everywhere you went. So that was, that was what I had. So many of these pictures are taken with my little handy-dandy iPhone. The Hospital San Lorenzo Los Mina opened in 1974 and is a specialty maternal infant hospital located in the mine neighborhood of Santo Domingo. Services at this facility are provided for free, which often means you get what you pay for. It is a state-funded hospital and receives donations from numerous private as well as international organizations such as the USAID. Until recently, the hospital was equipped to only handle 1,500 to 2,000 births a year. However, because it provides free services, it now routinely handles up to 14,000 births annually. Yes, 14,000. This, of course, puts great strain on resources. Many women travel from surrounding villages and from Haiti to receive treatment. Approximately 30% of patients seeking care at this facility are Haitian immigrants. There is chaos, no standardized patient management protocols, no electronic medical records in this facility. In fact, I'm not sure if they could find a medical record if a patient needed one. There are five residency programs at this hospital, including OBGYN, anesthesia, neonatology, pediatrics, and pediatric surgery. Daily sign-out multidisciplinary conferences took place to highlight the events which took place in the past 24 hours and to improve communication amongst all. In 2012, a new hospital extension was built with an additional 75 beds, 23 clinics, a delivery room, a surgery and obstetrics area, and a small ICU. This newer area has a modern air conditioning system and a new electrical system to improve the care of services provided. In the older area, the wards, the ORs have no AC and it is not uncommon to lose power with no backup generator available. Patients attending the prenatal clinic come early. They check in at the window to get their assigned number and then they wait sometimes up to two to three hours to be seen in the clinic. If they must proceed directly to the triage areas, these are crowded rooms, often with three gurneys apiece, and barely room to move. The patients are evaluated and then sent to one of several evaluation rooms that are often problem-specific, such as hypertensive complications room or threatened preterm labor room or infectious process room, where primarily patients with dengue fever and cholera are housed. In these areas, one must bring one's own sheet in order not to lay one's head on the plastic mattresses. The residents on average see 100 to 150 patients daily for triage evaluations. Patients never complain since the services and medications are provided for free. For the Haitians who do not speak Spanish, there may or may not be someone who can translate for them, so communication is often abysmal. Some patients were treated with respect, Others, not so much. Once the determination has been made that the patient must be admitted, she's taken to the cubby in the newly renovated laboring room. This room has 14 gurneys. The room is partitioned with short walls and some privacy curtains. The nurses and providers can essentially keep an eye on all the laboring patients at the same time. 
Continuous fetal monitoring is not considered standard of care. They do have six monitors, but they are underutilized for several reasons. They have no paper for the monitors. The nurses and the doctors have never been trained on how to read or interpret the monitors, and they don't have the belts to attach the Dopplers or the Tocos. The doctors use their hands to palpate contractions and stethoscopes to confirm decelerations or a bradycardia. Once the patient is determined ready to push her baby out, she's asked to get into a wheelchair, usually with some brown paper on the chair to keep her secretions off it. But we saw many who were transported emergently with no paper on the chair. They're taken to the delivery room, which is a single room with three cubbies for delivery, also not private. Basically, a baby factory with up to 45 deliveries occurring daily. Postpartum hemorrhage often goes unrecognized. As you can see in this photograph, patients who deliver vaginally are shuttled into another room where they remain for six hours prior to discharge home with minimal supervision, no vitals, no fundal massage. I was shocked at how many women I found laying in puddles of blood, many of them with no IV access, bleeding, and alone. Even when hemorrhage was recognized, there is limited access to medications in a timely manner, and the hospital blood bank only had 10 units of blood. The term nursery is like a baby factory. They were whisked away from their moms for evaluation and placed in bassinets, sometimes two per bassinet, with a lamp to keep them warm. We were told there weren't enough blankets to swaddle them. <laughs> We watched in amazement as these naked babies lay there pooping on themselves with no diaper and no blanket to swaddle them. We were told there simply weren't enough blankets to go around and they didn't have any to wrap the babies today. ¿Cómo cuántos nacieron hoy? Well, I hope this introduced you to kind of where I was hanging out for a week, but let's keep going. So the teaching hospital has about 189 residents. Of those, 72, 72 are OBGYN residents who were just hungry for knowledge. In one week, I think I went through the entire maternal fetal medicine Creasy and Resnick book. They were stuck to me like leeches, just begging for knowledge. And I kept thinking, I need to come back and I need to share and I need to bring more people with me and I need to deploy more people who are interested in teaching and sharing. The residents were all asked to wear white uniforms unless they were working in the delivery suite. And you could tell what year resident they were by the color of their shirt. The greens were R1s, the reds were R4s. This is a fourth year resident who happened to be pregnant. I think if you hang out in that hospital long enough, you end up pregnant without meaning to. There was a shortage of scrubs and masks and hats, and I found that I would stuff my hat in my pocket and carry it with me all day so that I could go in and out of ORs with the same hat. The same goes for the mask, because I wasn't always guaranteed a clean mask when I went into an operating room. The only pre-anything that I found there was pre-term labor, okay? There was no money for urine or cervical cultures. In the Dominican uh, Republic, there is no uh, pre-eclampsia. There is either no eclampsia or eclampsia, 
okay, we realize that preeclampsia is actually what we screen for at every prenatal visit and that it's a disease of prenatal care. The reality is that without prenatal care, you do not get preeclampsia. Mostly patients would come in with full-blown eclamptic seizures on a daily basis. I would say I saw an average of one to two at least eclamptic seizures a day. Like I mentioned, the fetal heart rate monitoring is essentially non-existent. Someone had donated six monitors and they were available, but no one knew how to use them. They just sort of sat there and they looked pretty in the new labor and delivery unit. The use of stethoscopes for fetal heart rate was what the residents fell back on. There was no continuous fetal heart rate tracing, no paper, no belts, no interpretation skills. Manual palpation was used for contractions. There was no tocos, certainly no intrauterine pressure catheter. The nurses would chart about once an hour what the heart rate Doppler was reading and then put the Doppler back on the machine. So what about quality of care? Management protocols for basic labor and delivery and complications were old-fashioned and certainly not evidence-based. There was a small library I found, which was their main area of resource, to guard the books and two computers sat there a librarian who basically did nothing. There were two terminals, but there was no access to the internet because apparently the bill for the internet had not been paid. Cell phone signal was extremely poor, so when I suggested to my residents, well, how about we go on Google, they looked at me and thought, hmm, that's an interesting concept. <laughs> okay, so in labor and delivery, 14 beds, there was four ORs that were running pretty much continuously. The epidural rate, I was surprised to find out, was less than 2%. They really rely on psychoprophylaxis, breathing and relaxation for pain management. Why? Because when a patient got an epidural, they had to actually assign an OBGYN resident and an anesthesia resident to sit by the patient's side to monitor vitals and so forth because there weren't enough nurses to go around to be able to monitor the patient uh, and make sure that she was safe. Vaginal deliveries usually go home in six hours. C-sections usually go home in 72 hours, barring any complications. There were no antibody screens available. Rogam was not consistently available. In fact, if they knew a patient was Rh negative and there happened to be Rogam in the medicine cabinet, they would go ahead and administer it, regardless of whether her antibody screen was positive or not, or even whether she had gotten Rogam or not. There was no understanding of who should or shouldn't get Rogam. Betamethasone or dexamethasone, depending on the drug du jour and what had been dispensed in the pharmacy, was available sometimes. It was only used for babies that were considered viable there, and that would be about 28 weeks in the Dominican Republic. Preterm labor treatment was unbelievably archaic. They were still using ritadrine. I can't remember using ritadrine for most of my career. It was used when I was a medical student, so this is more than 25 years ago. They didn't use any uh, indomethacin, no procardia. They'd never even heard of the current protocols that we have for preterm labor management. Eclampsia and preeclampsia were treated with magnesium sulfate, but this isn't a magnesium sulfate drip where they give the patient a four gram load and then run it at two grams per hour. This is IV pushes every hour on the hour. They would uh, basically mix the IV uh, magnesium and push it, and you hope that the nurse remembered to go back to the patient every hour on the hour. Magnesium was not used for neuroprophylaxis. In fact, they had no idea what I was talking about when I mentioned neuroprophylaxis with magnesium sulfate. If a patient needed an ultrasound, she would be shipped down to radiology, and she'd probably be gone for a couple of hours. Um, if she needed an ultrasound. The residents had no idea how to perform ultrasound. There was a decrepit old machine that I found on labor and delivery, but I had a really hard time even turning it on, so I gave up on that machine. I wished I'd had one of my little V-scanners with me. That would have come in very, very handy. Okay, now what about hemorrhage? Until recently, they were performing three to five, I repeat, three to five cesarean hysterectomies per week for hemorrhage control. Now they've uh, thankfully dropped that number to two. While I was there, I participated in one. Ergotonics and Pitocin are available, but you know it often takes several hours to get them sent up from the pharmacy. There were no Bacri balloons, although we did hear through the grapevine that the person who originally might have invented or participated in invention of the Bacri balloon might have been a Dominican. I have not been able to confirm that. 
The blood bank was really pathetic. There was a small little fridge with only approximately 10 units of blood when we checked in on it. So how can we cope with women that are hemorrhaging when we only have 10 units of blood in a blood bank? For those who were lucky to get prenatal care, they had started a system where family members could donate blood and you'd essentially get a credit in the blood bank, hoping that when you came in to deliver, if you had a credit in the blood bank, you might get priority for the blood in the blood bank if they happened to have blood bank that matched your type of blood. This, they think, might have decreased the rate of cesarean hysterectomies to two per week. What about hypertensive complications? Well, like I mentioned, eclampsia was extremely common every day. There was no option for serial labs like we have, where we check labs every six hours. Magnesium sulfate was given six grams IV push and then one gram in 10 cc's every hour. If a patient needed a CT, that was an interesting concept. She'd actually have to be sent to another hospital to get a CT if she was having an altered state of mind and you were worried about her having a hemorrhage in her brain. If she has a coagulopathy, she's in big, big trouble. In fact, she's probably going to become one of those maternal statistics. Minimal blood, blood uh, products were available. What we found out was that every pregnant woman who presents with hypertensive complications in pregnancy is going to get a cesarean delivery unless she comes in and she's ready to push her baby out and they don't have time or an OR available to take her back for delivery. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a case that really, really affected me. This is a patient that presented with eclampsia. She's a 19-year-old Gravita 1 Haitian girl with no prenatal care who was admitted after experiencing probably several eclamptic seizures at home. On admission, her blood pressure was 160 over 110, and they had a documented fetal heart rate of 85. This was about 8.30 in the morning when she was admitted. On uh, she had proteinuria on dipstick. They did get labs on her, which was good. And the liver function studies were in the 100,000s. Her platelet was 50,000. So she was diagnosed with HELP syndrome. They started magnesium, gave her a 4-gram bolus. And then 27 hours later, not a few hours later, 27 hours later, with no repeat labs, she went to the OR for a primary C-section under general anesthesia. The baby was born with APGARs of 1 and 0, weighing 3,500 grams. And the baby was suspected to be a term baby based on the weight. Um, it was suspected to have severe metabolic acidosis and it resulted in a neonatal death. The patient was noted to have bleeding from her incision site four hours after her C-section was taken back to the OR for cautery. And she received two of those 10 units from the blood bank. That's a big deal. Um, they left a yellow drain in place so they could see whether she was having excessive bleeding from the area that they had cauterized. So the next day when I came on, um, I uh, was doing rounds with the residents and said, we have a patient to show you in our new ICU. I said, great, let's go. And we went to the ICU and I actually was impressed by the new unit. It looked white. There was all these wires attached to the patient. But what struck me was she was laying there all by herself with monitors attached to her, but nobody was watching her at all. If you look at this, uh, at this flow sheet, and I'm not sure if you can see the numbers on it, what's fascinating, and this is the flow sheet from when she was admitted at 830, is that there are several blood pressures that are exactly the same. Every hour on the hour, 120 over 70, 120 over 70, 120 over 70, and so forth. And the fetal heart rate is documented every hour on the hour. In the first few hours, the baby was 85, 80, 78, 78. So this baby has been having decelerations for hours and hours and hours, but no one had a clue that the baby was becoming progressively sicker and sicker. And when I was reading this chart, I just had a pit in my stomach, and I thought, this baby would never have died had it come into one of our facilities here. Not at all. It would have been alive, and this was a term baby that had passed. So when I saw her, she had been eight hours post-op in the ICU. There was an NG tube down her throat. She was getting magnesium pushes every hour. Her blood pressure at that time was 150 over 80, and her pulse was 110. Her dressings were soaked. The patient was basically laying in a pool of blood and there was no RN in sight. We evacuated clots at the bedside from her, um, from her uh, wound and applied another pressure dressing. I expressed my condolences to the patient and she looked at me in amazement and said to me, my baby died? And I just wanted to throw up. 
I thought, how can this woman have been here for a whole day and no one's had a chance to even share with her that her baby had died? And she just closed her eyes and started praying. Tragedy with life lost due to a late entry of care just made me want to die. I was just devastated by this because this isn't something that we see every day. And it really made me realize that she had been sick for some time when she came in. So this is kind of how I found her in the ICU, and, the, and this was her urine. Um, you know, her urine was basically non-existent. She had peed maybe 30 cc's in the last eight hours. Her kidneys were shutting down. We opened up her dressing. We redressed her. We wrapped her with sheets as tight as we could. I felt like this must have been what it was like when people were in World War II and they had no access to anything. So you really start to become very resourceful when you're feeling like there's nothing else you can do for this girl because there was no more blood for her. Um, the next issue I wanted to cover is the issue of unsafe abortions, which we know is one of the major causes of maternal mortality in this country. The Dominican Republic is Catholic, and abortion is illegal even if there is a threat to the mom's life. It's estimated that at least 90,000 illegal abortions are performed per year. Most of these are self-induced or performed by backstreet providers with little training and little, little access to, to septic conditions. Cytotec is available on the black market for termination of pregnancy. An unsafe abortion is now considered in this country one of the primary courses for maternal morbidity and mortality, namely the third cause. It's a lucrative underground business, unfortunately, and women's economic status often determines the price. There's a high rate of incomplete abortions who end up in low-quality clinics or in the hospitals. Recently, there was a lot of news and press about this young teenager who was diagnosed with ALL, with leukemia in the Dominican Republic, and she had been denied treatment because there was a fear that the treatment in the first trimester would cause an abortion. And her mother took it all the way to the Supreme Court. But regardless of this, she was denied treatment by the time they started treatment. It was too late, and she and her baby died. Four to ten women were waiting in small rooms with no air conditioning for suction curatages daily for incomplete abortions. It was not uncommon for me to ask the woman, how long have you been waiting and bleeding here? And they say, about eight hours. But they weren't complaining. In fact, they were trying to keep each other busy and talking to keep from crying. Several of them waited more than a day for the procedure. They used paracervical blocks in this little back room procedure room, no anesthesiologist. There was a suction tube that was used um, daily, one tube. They sterilized it with Clorox between patients. Ring forceps were dipped in betadine and reused from patient to patient. Right outside the room, there was a huge garbage can that says ropa sucia, which means dirty clothing. And uh, it was just incredible. When you think about the fact that they had no idea how many of these patients had hepatitis, HIV, any of these sexually transmitted diseases, and there's uh, no control over how long these instruments lay in the Clorox um, for sterilization. Now, the Dominican Republic re recognizes that there's a big problem with teen pregnancy, and they've instituted several national policies to try to limit this and to try to prevent the problem with unsafe abortion, since many of these unsafe abortions are occurring in teen young girls. But unfortunately, despite all their efforts, the teen pregnancy rate appears to double the world's average, and it doesn't seem to be dropping. According to a recent report, the United Nations Population Fund says that 105 of every 1,000 teenagers become pregnant in the Dominican Republic, much higher than the world average, which is 49. And the percentage of teens who've been pregnant at some time in big cities is close to 20%, while in the rural areas is much higher, maybe one in four, one in three. This is despite Able, the ability for the teenagers to access free birth control. So the problem is that with free birth control, we're hoping to limit the number of teens that become pregnant, but there's no sex education to go along with the birth control, so they have no idea how to take the birth control. They think, maybe I'm going to have sex and take one of those pills, and I'll be safe. They don't realize they've got to take the pill every day. 
Now, turning to the cesarean delivery issue, the cesarean delivery rate was in the order of 45 to 50 percent. This is outrageous for a county hospital when you think about it. There were no trial of labors after delivery. Well, I understand that since they're not using continuous monitoring and intrauterine pressure catheters, then perhaps a TOLAC is a little bit unsafe. All patients with preeclampsia, except those presenting with advanced labor, were shuttled directly to the operating room. But I discovered in my teaching rounds that they had a whole list of extra indications for C-sections that are certainly not published in Williams' obstetrics of gynecology book. For example, if the baby was in the OP or occiput position, uh, occiput posterior position on ultrasound, that was an indication. If the ultrasonographer downstairs happened to notice that there was a cord around the neck, that was a reason for a C-section. What about if the sonographer said the placenta looked mature? That was a reason for a C-section because they suspected the baby wouldn't tolerate labor. Um, if there was a post-dates pregnancy, if they happen to know the dates and the patient was post-dates and the patient wasn't in labor, no reason to induce her. Go ahead and do a C-section. For sure, any twins. Anybody who heard an audible bradycardia with a stethoscope, automatic C-section. And even rupture of membranes at term without labor was an indication for a C-section. All right, now what about if you did go back for a C-section in one of those four rooms? This was an amazing experience for me. The C-section rooms were pretty incredible. The surgical drapes weren't always hung correctly because they didn't have enough things to hold the drapes up to protect the patient from where the anesthesiologists were, lit, were staying. The anesthesiologists often were, weren't wearing masks that covered their noses. They just wore their masks down near their mouth because it was pretty hot in those ORs. There was no time out, no scrub techs. You just pretty much had to help yourself to the instruments. And they chucked those instruments very dangerously back onto the table where the sutures were and where all the other instruments were. Um, the attending would only scrub in if there was a cesarean hysterectomy. She was way too, she or he was way too busy running around doing other things, or they were non-existent. I actually hardly saw any attending. I was the attending for a lot of things. The bovi pads were reusable. The bovi pads that we attached to patients, the good news is they had a bovi. The bad news is the bovi pads were put on over and over again until they didn't stick anymore. So the day before I left, a patient had gotten electrocuted because the bobby pad fell off. And they would stick the bobby pads with additional tape to help it um, stick better. So, you know, it was really pretty, quite incredible. On the left here, you can see the bobby pad on the bottom, and, and it looked pretty, pretty gross with some stains of blood used from patient to patient. Again, I found those forceps uh, dipped in betadine that they would use to transfer something to the operating area if they needed to bring the patient, the person who was operating something. Um, and the, the, the garbage sitting right outside the OR was pretty phenomenal. Well, 30% of patients delivering at Los Mina are Haitian immigrants. The Haitian women often cross the border to deliver, hoping for a better future for their child or perhaps for a safer delivery. Based on those statistics that I showed you, perhaps that's a, that's a reasonable approach. Um, but the problem is that the children that are born in Dominican Republic to Haitian moms have no citizenship. They're basically nobody. The Dominican Republic government enforces stricter anti-immigration policies, and unfortunately, they have nowhere that they belong to. I'm going to show you a video clip that was actually shared with me by a reporter, um, a student reporter um, that works at the Walter Cronkite uh, Journalism School, and I, uh, and I have permission to share this video with you. I thought it was a, it's a, it's a section of a video that she put together um, that I found very interesting. Whoops. Bring health for the people in this area, in this border. 
because they don't have any food. Not just Dominican, but Haitian too. Dime, Maria. Oh, pero no mi hija. Eh, entonces vamos a ver. en los pueblos, solamente la capital tiene servicios de salud. Por eso hay tanta necesidad y por eso cuando ellos vienen hay tantos problemas. We have a, a big problem with the Haitian community in the sense that they come uh, when they're ready to deliver and they haven't had any prenatal check. We don't have anything to start with. had always an open door policy that we would uh, take uh, anyone who comes. Si sí, ya estamos llegando a, a la comunidad, esta es la comunidad de San Isidro, como te fijas todos son haitianos, mira las condiciones como viven, son eh, extremadamente una pobreza extremada. Les hôpitaux de Haïti crasent et se crasent. Est, la vie en Haïti est un mal et la maison en Haïti se crase. La vitamine gratis pour Haïti, consulter gratis pour Haïti, que mieux que vous que Haïti. Pero es la mamá de esos esos, se murió. Eso, ¿Cómo? eso. Sí. ¿Cómo? Eh, con cesárea. Sí. ¿Y dónde? En los mismos, los mismos, los menos. What I was hoping to show you with this video is that people are crossing the border hoping that their children are going to be Dominican, maybe have a better life. But these kids are not registered as Dominican citizens, unlike in our country where a baby is born in our country and they become an American citizen. So they have no country. They're basically stateless. Let me turn a little bit to the neonatal ICU, which was a whole other experience. There are 42 beds total. 17 of the 42 were reserved for septic babies. Only one functional isolate. Only two infant ventilators. 
Only uh, one of them was actually functional. There was a couple of fluorescent bilolites, no bilirubin levels to be checked. 60% of the babies admitted to the NICU die. It is essentially survival of the fittest to the max. Viability, like I mentioned, was 28 to 29 weeks, not 23 to 24 weeks as we um, are aware of in our country. Antenatal steroids were reserved for those who might benefit. There was no way they were going to give a 24-weeker the steroids that could be given to a 28-weeker. There was limited supply of surfactant and ventilators. One vial of surfactant would cost a mother two months salary, minimum wage salary. So you can imagine that it's not easy to justify going and paying for surfactant. The pediatric neonatal intensive care unit currently has 42 beds. 17 of these are used for septic babies who are kept in a separate room. There was a small sink for hand washing with Hebeclins. Adherence to sterile technique was not optimal. Despite signs on the walls reminding healthcare providers to wear gloves, it was difficult to find a nurse who was drawing blood with gloves on. Gloves were available, they just did not use them. The nursery had two ventilators, but unfortunately only one was functional. The neonatologists often have to make the decision about which baby will get the next vent. That is, which one will live and which one will die. I found myself asking myself whether I would be able to make that decision. When I asked them how they did it, they responded, we would give it, of course, to the baby with the best chance of survival. Neonatal mortality in the NICU, they said, was about 60%. This is outrageously high. 28 to 29 weeks is considered the border of viability, and the head neonatologist told me that only 1 to 2 percent of babies born at this gestation were expected to survive. Antenatal steroids are reserved for 28 weekers and above and are not consistently available. Postnatal surfactant was only available sometimes, depending on supplies. Parents, of course, could go buy it at the pharmacy, but the cost is prohibitive and equivalent to two months minimum wage salary. One phototherapy lamp was kept working full time. Bilirubin levels were not checked. Decisions regarding whether they needed to be under the billy lights were somewhat subjective. There is so much we can do to improve the chances that these preemie babies may survive by improving care of the fetus in utero prior to birth, by securing supplies and much needed equipment for this unit, as well as by providing training to these highly motivated healthcare professionals who are doing the best they can with limited resources. Neonatal sepsis was a huge problem. Maternal GBS screening is not routinely done there. In fact, they didn't even know where they could get a GBS screen. Although there were no maternal cultures uh, for lab resources for the neonatal cultures were available sometimes. Blood cultures on the babies, I found out, usually grew out E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus. These are all organisms we typically think of in urinary tract infections. Antibiotics, interestingly, were very much available, but they were the big guns, amicacin, imipenem. These are probably donated from big companies. So you can imagine that there is a tendency to weed out and to select resistant organisms pretty quickly. Now, one of the highlights of my visit there was visiting the kangaroo program. Some of you may be familiar with what a kangaroo program is, but some of you may not. Initially, the kangaroo programs were developed to care for preemies in areas where incubators are not readily available, and they encourage newborn care skin to skin with an adult to ensure physiological and psychological warmth and bonding. Breastfeeding is uh, encouraged and promoted 100%. No formula used. Breast milk bank is, is available in the hospital. I was shocked to find out how efficient their breast milk bank was. It was pretty incredible. Patients were enrolled in the program because they were often discharged from the NICU and from the, from the nurseries very quickly with premature babies, and they returned to the hospital on a daily basis to meet with the healthcare team, then weekly when it was determined that they were safe to come back weekly, and then monthly for up to a year to ensure that the baby was doing well. 
The checkups were provided by a nurse practitioner, a nurse, and a physician. And the program is at risk, very, very high risk, for losing funding this year. So again, another pit in my stomach. This was one of the best run programs I encountered in my visit. And I vowed that I would make sure that was not going to happen. They need funding to keep going because this is the best thing they have to offer these little babies that are being discharged. It made me wonder, what about this infant mortality rate that's reported? How do we know how many babies that are discharged at six hours from the hospital really make it? How do we know they're not going back to the slums and just dying from cholera and so forth? The statistics are only as good as the source that they come from. These are some images from the kangaroo program where the women were piled up with all their little premature babies. And I really love this little guy in the middle, this little guy, um, this uh, one with a little uh, uh, hand up, because I wanted, to, I wanted to capture the peace sign since it was Physicians for Peace, but I, I just barely, barely didn't get that. I tried, though. Um, the Fundación Sol Naciente is an organization right next to the hospital where we spent some time that's supported in part by Physicians for Peace. It actually houses several clinics in there, including the Resource Mothers Program that we were involved with. Um, the Resource Mothers Program is modeled after the program that was a Virginia-based initiative here in our, own, uh, in our own city in affiliation with Children's Hospital of King's Daughters, and it was designed to improve health care of these young expectant moms. The program was launched in 2005 and was named Madres Tutelares, uh, Resource Mothers, and it has cared for several hundred women there. There are about 20 resource mothers. Each um, follows approximately 5 to 15 teenagers from 14 to 19 years old. They provide home visits to ensure that the patient gets to the clinic on a, week, on a uh, monthly basis. They help them go get their labs. They get them to the hospital. It's usually about an hour's walk from the slums where they live to get up to the hospital. Maybe they can hike on a, on a motorbike, but you know, in, in, in reality, it's not easy access. And they work hard to encourage the teenagers to remain in school. Um, I'm going to show you a little clip from Physicians for Peace uh, that describes this program. In this area, out of a thousand births, 32 babies die because of the lack of knowledge the mothers have, because they don't use vaccinations, they don't take the proper medications, they drink a lot of rum, they drink a lot of beer, and they don't eat properly. We motivate them not to drink rum or beer or coffee and tell them that if they smoke, it would be harmful to both them and the babies. That if they do, the babies will be born with lots of problems. 
Muchos problemas con los ojos, con la ceguera, con todo el problema del mundo. With all the problems el programa en sí es para evitar la mortalidad de los Because of these problems, so many babies are stillborn. Too many mothers and babies also don't get checkups. And then the babies suffer. And sometimes the mothers themselves die. To begin this program, we were trained here at the Los Mina Maternity Ward. After our training, we went out to the neighborhoods, knocking on doors to find those young pregnant women that needed help, orientation, and guidance. After finding them, we brought them to the maternity ward to give them a medical guide and training. And later, we would return to their homes each week to help them in the nursing process. We teach them everything about their pregnancy and caring for their infants. We tell them what they need to do month to month and continue to follow up on their child care. They want to expand this project to all the neighborhoods and all the towns because it has been so beneficial. And we we spent some time with Doctora Fernandez, who is an OBGYN resident that we trained at Riverside Hospital, who's Dominican, who currently lives in Santo Domingo, who um, has um, thankfully volunteered one day of every week to work with these teen moms uh, in this clinic, and she select, sees a select group of the patients uh, every week. Uh, she found a group of patients for Steve and I to, to see who had high-risk problems. We trained the resource mothers on the importance of screening for gestational diabetes. They weren't doing any screening. Lisa, um, Steve's wife, uh, spent some time teaching these resource mothers how to use glucometers. Um, we took uh, freestyle glucometers and strips that were donated by Abbott, and they have uh, vowed to help us uh, provide unlimited supplies for this clinic. We took a half a day to go on a field trip to the barrios near the Ozama River with two of the resource mothers to visit uh, patients in their homes, and uh, this was mind-blowing. These women provide incredible support to a group of young pregnant mothers living in the slums. The Osama River slums are unbelievable. There are thousands of working class people, mostly unemployed, living in these barrios and shanty towns with border to the river. The pollution of the river is legendary from people, um, from their waste, as well as from many industries that have uh, dumped waste into this river. Those living in the area of the Ozama River live in appalling conditions. The houses often flood, there's mudslides. They're almost existing with no potable water, no electricity, no main sewage, no trash collection. They're vulnerable to cholera, they're vulnerable to typhoid and any, any uh, um, waterborne disease. This uh, river slums is the focal point for trash, for pollution, for poverty. The houses are pieced together with scraps of metal, with palm trees, with sugar cane, with concrete blocks. The river floods when it rains, and often these women and, and families need to evacuate with their babies. But despite this poverty and misery, I found so many interesting things on the wall. I found an ad for you to get a French manicure. I found a hairdressing salon that advertised that they had a generator so they'd be able to do your hair no matter what, whether there was electricity or not. And I even found Mickey Mouse. These children, these Ozama River slum kids, they don't know any better. When the sun goes down, it's bedtime because it's dark. When it rains, they don't go to school because they might need to be evacuated later that day. The likelihood that these girls will become pregnant is one in three when they become teenagers, and they will have access to free contraception, but no one's going to educate them on how to use this contraception correctly. Okay, um, in the van where they all collect the water and they, they put, they put, they put I found that these kids had such hope in their hearts and were the future, and they had no idea what they were missing. They had no idea what they were missing. So planning for the future, 
We're working to expand the Resource Mothers program, training services provided, the number of girls that are served in that area and perhaps in other barrios in the Santo Domingo area. We're working to expand educational exchange with staff in Los Mina Hospital, hoping to develop updated algorithms for management of postpartum hemorrhage, preterm labor, neonatal resuscitation, infection control, Decreasing the C-section rate is essential. Increasing the use of fetal heart rate monitoring might be a good idea in a setting like this. We're working with Physicians for Peace to obtain needed supplies, equipment for both the maternity and the pediatric units. Physicians for Peace builds peace and international friendships through medicine, and the mission is to further the cause of the world peace and international goodwill by providing quality medical education and care to those in need. I walked past this little poster every day that I was there, and I dragged Steve to, uh, to the poster so we could take a picture together. I'm going to show you what the poster says here. It says, it's a baby being born. It says, uh, no te digo que va a ser fácil, si te digo que valdrá la pena. I'm not telling you that it will be easy, but I am telling you that it will be worth it. And I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to participate in this mission because it was a life-changing experience for me. And I thank Elisa Fernandez for providing some of the, um, some of the uh, wonderful hospitality that she did for us while we were there. Um, it was major payback for all the teaching that we did while she was a resident. And Anulfo Ramon Lopez is the Physicians for Peace uh, physician representative in Santo Domingo, who is an amazing person, who is very involved with the Fundación Sol Naciente, and who is more than, uh, more than gracious as a host. I'm working with several organizations to recruit donations for equipment and supplies for Physicians for Peace. On the slide here is the name of Ken Hudson. He's the person you can contact if you know of anybody. Um, and with this, I thank you for your attention. And I hope that I've inspired a few of you to think in your hearts, why wouldn't I be involved with an organization like this at some point in my career? I really want to reach the young medical students who ha somehow in their minds are focused on biochemistry and all this. And, and, and I want them to remember the whole reason why they chose to go into medicine. And it's taking me all those years to really regroup and stop these busy, busy uh, days that I'm dealing with and stop and go and take a week away so that I could really think about why, why am I doing this and what can I do to make the world a better place. Thank you.